Coast and Jabalisco, W1GV, back at you with the second installment in the duology of why 50 ohms. Why do we choose 50 or 52 ohms as the standard impedance for ham radio systems? I left off at the end of the last video with an explanation concerning the construction of coaxial cable, but it doesn't really explain why 50 ohms was chosen, for example, instead of 60 or 75 or maybe even 80 or 90 ohms. 50 ohms is by far the most common impedance of ham radio cables, and almost every ham radio that you buy will ask for a 50 ohm non reactive impedance or 50 ohms purely resistive. Well, let me begin by showing you two very common antenna systems that ham radio operators use. One is a vertical over a perfectly conducting ground or a ground plane counterpoise that imitates a perfectly conducting ground. You connect the center conductor. Let's just uh, illustrate this as a system with a counterpoise of radial wires, quarter wavelength long each. You connect this to the braid of the coax, the ground or the counterpoise, and you connect this part here to the center conductor. That's one way of uh, making an antenna. If this is a quarter of a wavelength here, and the radial system is a very good one, or you're over perfectly conducting ground, you will see at this feed point, at the resonant frequency, the fundamental frequency where the, these lambda over four wavelength one quarter wavelength prevails, you'll see that as about 36.5 ohms, sometimes rounded up to 37 ohms, purely resistive impedance. Now there's another kind of antenna that ham radios often use, and that is a half wave dipole with a quarter wave on this side, a quarter wave on that side. You feed the braid or the shield of the coax to one side of the dipole and the center conductor to the other side. Or ideally you should put a one-to-one -one transformer known as a ballon at that feed point, but uh, I will just maybe worry about that in a future video too. And you run that down to your transmitter and when you do that you find that uh, if the antenna is in the clear and it's up in an ideal situation, you get a characteristic, or pardon me, you get a purely resistive impedance of just about uh, 70, 74 ohms, I believe, 73 ohms. It, 73 ohms. Yeah, that's it. I remember now. <laughs> Getting old, you know what I'm saying? So... Neither of those makes a very good match to 50 ohm coax. You'd say, why would they choose 50 ohms or 52 ohms? Well, it turns out something very interesting happens. Let's take the geometric mean of these two numbers, 36.5 and 73. Now, the geometric mean of two numbers what you do is you multiply them and then take the square root. So let's take 36.5 and then uh, multiply that by, oops, I'm sorry. Let's start that over. Let's just launch this calculator all over again. It's kind of hard for me to see this. I forgot to put my reading glasses on. Sorry about that. Let's take 36.5 and then multiply that by 73 and then take the square root. That would be uh, right there. 
51.6. Now if we round that up to 52, we'll get the number, one of the numbers that is a very common standard for purely resistive impedances in ham radio systems. Well, okay, that's great, you say. What good is that? Well, it turns out that when you take the geometric mean of two impedances like this, and you come up with a number, the standing wave ratio that you get if you feed this antenna with that line is the same as the standing wave ratio you're going to get with that one. You can do the math. Just uh, I'll make a, another video uh, pretty soon about what exactly geometric mean means as opposed to the arithmetic mean. But let's suppose you feed a vertical antenna with this kind of a system. The standing wave ratio will be 50 ohms or 52 ohms ideally in that situation, but it's often just rounded down to 50. Uh, it, it doesn't really make much difference in the end pra in practical terms. Let's divide that by 36.5 and we get 1.424 standing wave ratio. Okay, now let's start over with this and divide 73 ohms by 50 ohms. Pardon me, I made a mistake there. Start over. 73 ohms divided by 52 ohms. 1.4038. Well, it's pretty near the same. 1.4 to 1. I rounded that to 52 ohms when I really got 51.6 in the original geometric mean calculation. That's why they're not identical, but about 1.4 to 1. So if you feed either kind of antenna like this with 52 ohm coax, you're going to get a standing wave ratio of 1.4 to 1. Well, you'd say, oh, don't you really want a standing wave ratio of 1 to 1 exactly? And the answer is you don't really have to have an SWR of 1 to 1 exactly in order to get the optimum performance out of an antenna system. In fact, as long as you are less than 2 to 1 with your standing wave ratio, your radio will usually operate properly and accept that much of a mismatch. And not only that, but as for the SWR loss, you've probably heard about that. As for the SWR loss, you can get up to about a 2 to 1 SWR on your line and suffer a loss that is so small that it's less than 1 decibel, even for very long lengths of relatively lossy coaxial cables. So 2 to 1 anything less than that and you're you're in for all intents and purposes you're just as good as a perfect match so 1.4 to 1 is more than good enough so it's an excellent and perfect compromise 52 ohms and i'm not sure that that is what drove these uh, the people, the powers that be, to come to this conclusion as the standard characteristic impedance for ham radios, but I'd venture to say that were we to convene uh, a gaggle of gurus together and come up with a, a good figure, they'd come just about right on that number, 52 ohms. So with that, I'll say, and then, you know, 50 ohms, 52, negligible difference. We're talking an imperfect world. We aren't dealing in pure mathematics here. We're dealing in real-world engineering. So that's my theory, anyway, as to why that's done. Stan Gibalisco, signing off. Hope you got some out of this duology of videos. Till next time, 73 and so long.